live your life, boy. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Conspiracy Farm, where we don't start the conspiracies, we just add the water. And now, your host of the most state-of-the-art, most informed podcast on the interweb, I present to you, Pat Militage and Jeffrey Wilson. Ladies and gentlemen, are you ready for war? Yeah, rear naked choke of Cocker Spaniel, bro. You don't yeah, change, bro. change the neighborhood up. Conspiracy Farm, go. Check it out. Greetings, salutations, ladies and gentlemen. Jeffrey Wilson coming to you one more again with another episode of The Conspiracy Farm. As always, chilling, hanging out on this beautiful day, riding shotgun. UFC Hall of Famer, Pat Melichick, champion. You got your workout in today. How are we feeling? I'm feeling good. Just trying to keep up with my year old daughter who's a an athlete, great rower. Got some sunshine, some five-minute rounds of 40-yard sprints in, a bunch of push-ups, a bunch of abs. And I'll do a bag routine tonight after uh, – after a bag in the in the garage, nice. Yeah. Staying fit. Be anxious to update on when possibly maybe the uh, fights might be rescheduled. That you we have had a planned. That I won't team. announce it yet. Okay. Well, soon, soon to come, ladies and gentlemen, soon to come. Well, another incredible guest that we have here today. Very anxious to chop it up to, with this guy here, um, man. He's, he's quite the big brain on you know what they're doing to our kids, man, weaponizing and, and brainwashing our kids and conditioning them in and, and all kinds of different ways. He is uh, John Kleisick. Uh, he is a has a master's in English and has taught college rhetoric and research argumentation for over eight years. His literary scholarship concentrates on the history of global eugenics and Aldous Huxley's dystopic novel Brave New World. He is the author of School World Order. Democratic globalization of corporatized education. So stoked. We've had some issues in scheduling, but we have him here today. John Kleisek, how are we doing today, sir? Great, sir. Happy to be here, man. Thanks a lot. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I mean, there's so much we could get into here. And, you know, I'm really kind of going to just set you up with, you know, some nice some nice softballs, soft pitches here, so you can really kind of knock it out of the park because there's really a lot to this. And you kind of give us an outline that hopefully we can follow and so you can help inform us, you know, what's going on in the world. Talk, you uh, got into this. How long have you been a professor? What prompted you to to write these books, et cetera? Um, so i um, been teaching for about eight years. Uh, I guess I, I, liked, I liked the humanities. I wanted to teach humanities. Um, I like the arts. You know, I like philosophy. I like history. I like, like all that stuff. Uh, so I, I uh, they didn't have a humanities degree. So, you know. Uh, quickest way to combine that is I found was uh, literature, English literature, uh, you know, and, and, you know, I train in rhetoric as well. Uh, and I teach at the community college level. So I teach everything from developmental writing all the way to, you know, research argumentation, English 102, composition, all that type of stuff. Mm. Uh, what got me into writing the book was basically when Bruce Rauner, he was our governor in Illinois a few years ago, was kind of stalling on the budget. Uh, I saw it as basically, you know, uh, a Hegelian dialectic play. So, you know, bankrupt education, that's the problem. The reaction is, you know, privatization. Uh, and so, and so there we are. Uh, and so I, um, basically, if you looked at a lot of his statements, uh, he was throwing out a lot of buzzwords that, uh, Charlotte Thompson is repeat, uh, threw around. So that's, that's one of the books that are the basis of my research. Okay. So Charlotte. Wrote the deliberate dumbing down of America. She also blew the whistle on Project Best. Uh, and basically her research shows that education is going to move towards privatization through this thing called school choice. It's going to turn academics into workforce training. Uh, and then that's through public-private partnerships that will merge healthcare, criminal justice, and education all together uh, through, through data, through big data. Uh, and so when Browner was stalling on the budget, he's throwing around school choice, school choice. He actually owns charter schools. These are these are basically they're not they're not private schools. They're public private schools. So it means it's a it's a private corporation that gets public dollars um, to basically, you know, teach your kids. Um, so you're you're subsidizing a private company, neither public nor private. And, uh, you know, he was throwing around terms like cradle to career. Right. And so that's workforce training. Uh, I'd gone to some conferences, uh, and uh, the uh, it was NIU, I think, Northern Illinois University, uh, was throwing around the P20 Council and the, the, the public-private partnership. So all these things are happening at a time when my one of my departments basically, um, basically, you know, went bankrupt. So they they shut it down for a certain amount of time. And at that point, I you know, I never really wanted to write in about education. I didn't want to like poo poo where I worked. You know, I'd written some stuff on other topics. Uh, kind of wanted to keep a safe buffer for employment and things like that. 
Um, but then it was like, well, it looks like I might not have employment. So I guess I'll go ahead and give my opinion. I mean, I can at least have an opinion, right, if it's going to happen. <laughs> um, yeah. So I did that. And um, Charlotte saw the article and said, you're spot on. And we became really good friends. Uh, you know, basically, she wrote the forward for me. It was my research partner. Uh, and as I'm writing this, I don't know this at the time, but she's also the person that, you know, her, 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 her dad – and her grandpa were in the Order of Skull and Bones. So another key mm. source that my book's based on is the America's Secret Establishment Introduction to the Order of Skull and Bones by Anthony C. Sutton. Anthony wrote that book based on the black address books that Charlotte leaked to her from her from her parents. And you know, I'm writing about the Hegelian dialectic. Well, that's one of the big that's one of the big things that uh, Sutton saw. So Sutton was he was an author of Western Technology and Soviet Economic Development when he was a professor for the Hoover Institute at Stanford University. Uh, and he basically found that we were funding the Soviets the whole time during the Cold War, everything from the Bolshevik Revolution all the way through the through the end of the Cold War. And he said, well, basically, you know, we're, we're building these enemies. Why are we giving them? We, they wouldn't even have been able to become formidable enemies had we not built their railroads, their infrastructure, et cetera. Uh, and so he found that when he got the address books, because it didn't make sense to him, that, you know, the, the common thread was – the banks that, that largely fund, so Ruscombe Bank, uh, Guarantee Trust, things like that, also funded the Nazis. Uh, that these people were, the Order of Skull and Bones was playing both sides of these uh, sure. political conflicts in order to come out on top. And so, um, so those are the, so those are the two two key books that uh, kind of got me into writing about uh, you know, the articles. I just kept writing articles. They kind of developed into a series, and I basically asked Charlotte, "Hey, would you would you kind of get on board if I wrote a book?" Uh, she sent me to Chris Milligan. Chris Milligan is the guy that published Anthony Sutton's research, actually wrote another book with him called Fleshing Out Skull and Bones, Investigations into America's Most Powerful Secret Society. So he also is himself a, a researcher of the order, and he's got a very interesting backstory if anybody wants to check that out. Um, mm. So that's that's the background to the book. That's how I got into it. Um, and that's that's kind of that's the baseline, I guess. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's absolutely, I mean, we've talked about it too, uh, you know, the Frankfurt School and just, you know, like, like the overall dumbing down in the program of our kids. Talk to us a little bit about the role of the, like the Frankfurt School and that kind of uh, curriculum does, you know, Common Core, all of that. Okay, so, you know, it's, it's basically the opposite of a classical education. Uh, and, you know, my solution at the end of the book, one of its five point solution. So, you know, local control, uh, local control, public control. Uh, digital student privacy abolished the psychological method of conditioning instead of classical learning. Okay, and then part of that though comes with, uh, you know, classical philosophy and what I call what's what's often called the trivium. So the classical learning of grammar, logic, and rhetoric. So grammar means uh, not just you know words, but it's the ability to name the categories of the mind and the categories of reality. Logic is the ability to put those. Uh, names put that grammar together in non-contradictory ways and rhetoric is the ability to express it without contradiction it's also the ability to weed out fallacies and the propaganda of corporations and governments okay mm -hmm. so when you do this when you use rhetoric properly this is called what we call truth right and truth is always non-contradictory in the classical method frankfurt school right. is totally opposite okay basically postmodernist stuff it, it you know when we talk about logic you can break it down into two Two branches, formal logic, you know, you have deduction and induction, okay? So in, uh, deduction would be what they call a priori ways of knowing, okay? So prior is the root. It means knowledge comes before measurement. A posteriori would be induction or empiricism. It means knowledge comes after measurement. Well, with induction, the, the point is or the, the ultimate end is that you can never measure the entire sample with induction. So just like the models we've been looking at lately, right, they're, all, they're always up to uh, recursive, uh, uh, you know, uh, looking at it again. Um, so what that means, though, is that, you know, induction has to be based on some a priori principle first. Uh, the Frankfurt School, if you take induction without an a priori principle like natural law, uh, you know, the Greeks might have used a term like the logos. The, uh, the, in the East, you had the Tao or the Urta or the Dharma or the Asha. All these concepts that, you know, that there is an objective reality and that your mind should correspond to it, and we call this truth. If you, without those underneath induction, I'm not saying empiricism or empiricism or induction is bad, but without those, you 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 end up in skepticism. And skepticism can basically break it down in existentialism and phenomenology. And if in the Frankfurt School, basically would combine that with 
Well, they came out of a Marxist background, but since everybody saw that, you know, a Marxist idea that you could just reduce stuff to, to an economic patterns didn't really work out, that's, that's why we also refer to it as cultural Marxism. So you find another way to collectivize people, not around economic induction, but around skepticism, basically. And it leads to something called uh, basically uh, performance identity is what they call it. And it's just a, it's a refutation of existentialism, which means uh, that, you know, existentialists said that you should just be authentic. Well, they say there's no such thing as authenticity. And so that means everything is a performance. So it leads to basically this relativist, you know, I guess we would call it the social justice. You know, it's the opposite of the golden rule. Every Instead of everybody should be treated based on the same principles, it's everybody has their own relative principles that everybody else should uh, defer special treatment towards. Yes. Um, and it leads, it, it leads to something. Sorry, go ahead. Jump in, man. I'm I was just saying, we're seeing a lot of that. We're seeing a lot of that. Go ahead. <laughs> no, I was just saying, yeah, we're seeing a lot of that kind of moral relativism. Me. Yeah, I'm sorry. No, no, go, go ahead. ahead. I'm sorry, but my, my, I got a lag, I think, on my, my computer. No, I, I was interrupted. I was just saying, we're seeing a lot of that. That kind of just my, everyone adapt to my reality as opposed to there being necessarily some kind of objective reality. I can open the door for some, but others will freak out on me. Yeah, you know, and you're seeing it with a lot of the way these policies are being, you know, like some of the social distancing policies. I went somewhere where they had half open, so you could stand in line shoulder to shoulder, but you couldn't be inside, in, you know, shoulder to shoulder. I mean, this, this is a small example, but it, it's pervaded the culture. Uh, and so, you know, b before we look at the technology itself or the companies that run the technology or the laws that oversee the technology, uh, we really have to have values, right? Some transcendent a priori values about, right? Uh, you know, the golden rule and things like that. And otherwise, it bleeds out in all these, all these weird ways. But uh, you know, it does try, try into something. I think it ties into something called transhumanism. So transhumanism, right? Is this idea comes out of eugenics, basically yeah. that you know the eugenicists thought that you could perfect the human by uh, genetic engineering. If you actually look at the uh, first international eugenics congress, you ever seen the eugenics tree? It's a famous picture. You've probably seen it. Uh, and it says eugenics in the root, and then it says something like it draws from many different disciplines or branches, and then it's got these roots underneath. And if you look at the roots, uh, it says everything from anthropology to history to law to psychology. And so if you – so they've always kind of looked at eugenics as not just – you know, this nature versus nurture, but, you know, combining nature and nurture sciences, so the, so the behavioral psychologist and the eugenicist come together in this thing called transhumanism through the computers, right? And so they basically think that we can evolve by interfacing right. with the computer. Well, if you're no different than, you know, if there's no natural law, then there's nothing different between, you know, a biological organism and a rock or a computer. And, you know, if that's the case, then, you know, there's... If we can move down that road, then it just kind of preps us to be like, yeah, that's that's that seems that seems okay, right? To plug into that there's nothing unnatural about plugging yourself into a computer, right? Um, and, and isn't that kind of where they went with? Uh, I think it's Sophia, the Saudi Arabian little whatever that was that they gave human rights to, or whatever it was. This merging of man and machine. Yeah, that's yeah. what it was. Yeah, yeah, they gave it, they gave it, um, they gave it citizenship, and it, that's you know, they got huge smart cities out there as well. Yeah, um, you know, he, Elon Musk has got his Neuralink, you know, um, yeah. and he recently is now he's ready for human human trials. He's, it's, the, the fancy that's that's the name of his company. The the term for those type of technologies, brain computer interface. Or human computer interface, or brain machine, or or human machine. All three of those acronyms. If you want, if anybody wanted to look that up, those would be. And you got everybody from Microsoft uh, to uh, uh, Facebook, uh, Neuralink. I, I don't. I'm not. Sure, I can't remember if Google is, but those three uh, off the top of my head, I know, are working on BCIs. Yeah. Well, and it was. Um, I, what was it? Uh, yeah, Joe Rogan last week. At Elon Musk was on Joe Rogan, and it was uh, my. my casual they were talking about melding no just put a little inch diameter hole in your head if you have a stroke you can get your language back or if you're a paraplegic you can get your function yeah everybody's doing he's like you're already a basically a cybernetic organism you have a phone like he literally equated having a phone to basically you know having a chip in your brain which was just crazy 
and the and the the device links to an app, a Bluetooth app that goes to your phone. They said this on I think the press release. So you, so you know he went on Joe Rogan the first time. Then he had a press release. So if you want to see the device, you can see it. It's uh it, you know both the com this big robot computer that that uh, puts it in your head and also the little chip with the little wires or the laces and it literally goes to an app on your phone and I, I used to joke with my students you know they're on their phones all the time I say stuff like hey, you know one day they're gonna put that phone in your head and it's literally <laughs> that actually um, well, what do you thought I mean people what, what happens when the battery runs out and and your your you know the correctness was for a stroke and suddenly, you know, you start, you start, you know, gimping again, or your left side goes limp and it doesn't work, and your speech goes all, all screwy, and it's like, gotta charge this battery, man, gotta charge. Or, this or a solar flare, you get hit with an EMP, and you're back the to being EMP a paraplegic. Goes, uh, I wonder. Yeah, it all goes down. We all yeah, well, go down at that point if they put it in everybody's head, right? And even if let's say, let's say somehow, you know, they got a, a, those things don't happen. You know this stuff has to update constantly. I mean, that's you right. know, it evolves so fast. So what do you do? Pull it out of your head, or is it going to have you know? I mean, they're going to thread more laces. I mean, you know, well, imagine happens, trying to. Yeah, what happens when somebody hacks into the main system and uploads the truth? Well, yeah, I mean, ho hopefully someone could upload the truth. But when you said that, the first thing I said I'm thinking of is you know. Uh, the Internet of Things and something called social credit when you're when you're talking about the yeah. main system and and uh, right you know that's that's kind of where you know I so so in the book I looked at three types of technologies that they would data mine students with uh, so one is adaptive learning software it's basically cognitive behavioral stuff it's based on the behavioral uh, psychological method of stimulus response conditioning also known as classical conditioning and then you get the modern version of operant conditioning. Uh, then there's another type of technology called socio emotional learning biofeedback stuff. All right. And Pat, you've probably seen biofeedback stuff in athletics before. You know, it gives you sure. just the heart rate monitors, right? You know, the Fitbits, all that type of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> but this stuff basically wants to measure everything from the students. Uh, so the Gates Foundation had these things called galvanic skin response monitors. So it's through the skin conductivity, can measure engagement. They want to measure EEG, right? So the, your brain waves when the kids are looking at uh, the. The screen or whatever and there's a company called brain co it's, it's uh, financed by a chinese state-owned company yeah. then there's neurocore okay neurocore does eeg as well but it's for adhd training uh and betsy devos is one of the main funders of that she used to be on the board she, she got off the board right when she came uh, secretary but she still she still is invested in it uh and so so that's that's the social emotional stuff the third one is the precision dna precision precision education which means Basically, it's based on your DNA, all right? So they're going to give you personalized or tailored lessons based on your IQ, your genetic IQ in particular. Uh, you know, so all that genetic stuff. Genetic IQ. How was how is that extrapolated? Genetic IQ. So so uh, twenty three and me, it's it's not actually very precise. <laughs> Funny enough, right? With the name. <laughs> no shit. The, the precision. So I should say the precision uh, education. Borrows its term from something called precision medicine, which is all about uh, genetics, uh, genetic uh, healthcare, and so that stuff might be more precise, you know, especially when it comes to like, you know, we, we do know as far as heredity, we can we can look at certain inheritances, certainly, you know, with just basic phenotypes, hair, eye color, stuff like that. But other things, you know, I, I think they got pretty good data on the, the cancer genes, the, the breast cancer gene. But then um, you have the epigenetic in, side of it. You know, why aren't twins getting, you know, one twin getting cancer and the other doesn't? So there's an epigenetic side to it, too, that we're, oh, more, we're, we're learning more about. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's just that with some of those, the algorithms they use now, the you know, when they do any of these genetics tests, it's, you know, it's, it goes back to induction. It's all induction. So they get enough people who exhibit a particular trait and then they scan their DNA and they say all the people that have this trait have this sequence. Well, they might have all five sequences. Or they might all have, right? And then and then you still don't have the guy or girl who goes into the, can pump, jump into the system who's got a totally different sequence with the same, uh, with, with the same conditions. So, so in other words, the accuracy of that test is based on the sample, which is, by the way, what I think is why they really want contact tracing in the test everybody because then they'll have uh, have a bigger sample of DNA to make to be more precise with uh, the correlations between the DNA sequence and the phenotype or the disease or completely whatever. Completely running so over with, HIPAA laws. Completely running over and trouncing the HIPAA laws. 
Absolutely. And, uh, you know, and blending that. And that's why I see the contact tracing as the beginning of social credit. It's the beginning. They want to blur those lines uh, and, you know, and <laughs> and through the education system as well. Um, you know, some of the schools are talking about, you know, what should be their role to help in contact tracing. So now you're blurring FERPA lines. That's your federal yeah. education rights and privacy right. with the HIPAA laws. Right. And then if you add in the pre-crime stuff, the, um, the, the criminal justice component. Then you're then you're adding you know uh, you know basically due process you're, you're you're getting rid of that I guess I should say by blurring it all all together uh, and so you know I, I see that as the, the beginning of of social credit um, they put you in put you in jail right when you come out of the womb because you're genetically predisposed to commit a certain crime I, mean, I know it sounds absurd but, but wow. They, they- they did that, though. I mean, like, I, I show my students, you know, uh, because I, I teach Brave New World and English 102, so they do research projects. But we read the novel in the meantime, and I largely <laughs> like them to do essays based on, uh, you, know, techno- you know, technology in the future, right? I mean, uh, the stuff that's on your doorstep that's, like, getting thrown at you every day. It's not even, you know, these aren't intellectual exercises. Like, I, I give them this for practical reasons. But I like them to read Brave New World because... It's 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 a freaky novel. I mean, some people are probably disturbed by it. Some people are probably entertained by how disturbing it is. Uh, but it was written in 1930, and it's basically everything we're looking at. And I, I, just and say I like it's very show, prescient. Like, very prescient. Yes. And what was going on at the time? I show them the history. You know, let's, we're talking about the early eugenics movement, and they did <laughs> say is it promiscuity, uh, poverty, crim- you know, cr- criminal tendencies. All these things were hereditary. Or, you know, they didn't have genes quite yet. That's not till the you know, 60s or the late 50s, or early 60s. You know, but, you know, they use their little Mendelian graphs to say, hey, your daddy did it and your mama did it and grandma and grandpa. So, you know, this pattern that we can trace just like, you know, when Mendel did his peas. So they, they, they do do that or they, they do. They have done that. And I've looked at new <laughs> I've looked at new journals, you know, academic journals. They're in my book where they want to retake the bring back physiognomy, which is, in, which is uh, people might know what phrenology is, so that's where you'd measure the skull, the different shapes of the skull to say how evolved or not evolved somebody mm-hmm. was, and then that would, you know, hey, you need to be sterilized because your skull's not shaped right. Right. Uh, well, physiognomy was just, it went, it went beyond that. It wasn't just the skull, it was also your different facial features, and that there, uh, there was a, a Duquesne's, um, uh, one of these nobles in England, he had a book full of different criminal facial types. And so, you know, the, and they, so they looked at So now that they got all these facial recognition cameras, they're yeah. going like, oh, well, now we can now it's not just somebody's, you know, opinion. We can put metrics we, in, again with induction, again with metrics. Right. We can use these metrics to say that you're going to be a criminal. Right. Well, it's, um, it's, it's and easy. To, it's, and it's also easy to say, you know, that, you know, anybody, any man with any kind of alpha features is going to be is going to be flagged without a doubt because we're a danger without a doubt. One hundred percent. Yeah, and you know, and, and that goes for you know not just you know whatever facial features they might attach, but you know your ideas. And I, you know, now that I'm, I've never caught online, too high. got too much testosterone in this one. We got to put this one down. Yeah, your algorithms are uh, your EEGs are showing too much aggression, right? Your heart rate is too high right now. It reminds me of uh, I think it was Elysium, where the guy's irritated in line, and it's like, sir, you can't get your you're not going to get through the line until you calm your heart rate down. Uh, and by the way, it, it, I'm sure you all noticed that. Just look at the, if you watch TV, but you probably get the ads on you know your whatever feed you have in general. You broke up a little bit health, there. Say it again. Um, has anybody been noticing the mental health apps that are being commercialized and pushed on various news articles or on commercials on t- uh, well if you haven't you know peek around a little bit they've been around for a while but if, if you just go through and read the news enough you'll find people saying that coronavirus is really causing mental health which I'm sure it is right so with their <laughs> So their solution, though, is they've got some some apps for you. Some some uh, basically what we're talking about. They're, they won't call them socio emotional learning apps in the you know in the commercial field for the general consumer. But you know your Fitbits, your meditation apps, the Calm app, all this stuff is basically the beginning of that. And you know don't think that that thing is especially if you're downloading it for free. Don't think that that data is not going somewhere. That's why it's free. Right. And, right. you know, uh, so when they blur these lines, you know, through, through contact tracing and whatever else they got down the pipe, you know, they maybe they, maybe they can't aggregate it now. 
But all, all they need really is the, the right <laughs> crisis to basically say, yeah, well, we're just gonna blo- we're just gonna dump all that data into one one big profile for you, right? You know, and we'll give big you access. fusion centers. And I just, yeah, I'm sorry, just because I just it's pop- I just put it on my Twitter today. Uh, the co- COVID pass. It's a biometric. It's, it's a biometric uh, ID. I don't know if it's an app or how it works, but it's it's on there. Um, you can you can look at the actual website. I did it right before I came on the show. Yeah, and people but, are downloading. Uh, I, I saw people on- are downloading. There are apps for COVID nineteen and contact tracing and all this stuff that people are that people are willingly downloading on their phones. And please, if you're hearing this. Do not download those apps on your phone, you idiots. And also, you if might not, want to turn off. If they're not doing off, it automatically. Yeah, yeah. Just say, you might want to turn off your automatic updates just in case, you know, because it might be, you know, for your health because they care about you and they want to protect you. So <laughs> yeah, they're going to put course. it on their floor, right? Yeah. Well, dude, I mean, in this, what's so crazy, and we've seen this play out in just the way and the myriad of ways that the social engineers, the, the behavioral scientists have conditioned us through a certain kind of predictive programming. You're talking about Brave New World, which came out in the 30s. You know, the, the talk of technocracy through the Rockefeller Foundation and the eugenicists started, you know, way back in the 40s and 50s. And they've slowly been pushing us and acclimating us. You know, you got uh, who Kurzweil talking about the singularity. We saw it in the Jetsons, right? Buck Rogers, Star Wars. Um you know, Terminator, you know, the meld of man and machine, et cetera, et cetera. Talk to us about that slow roll, how they how they make it kind of cool and they condition you to slowly begin to accept, almost like finalizing with almost like an Elon Musk having this casual conversation. Well, you're already a cybernetic organism. You got a phone. How's that, how's that slow roll of social engineering play out over decades affect how we receive it? Okay, so there's two two interesting points to that. So one is how the media is used and we can, you know, going back before TV, we can include media as, you know, the, the science fiction novelists, right? So, you know, yeah. H.G. Wells and Huxley and all these Jules guys. Verne. Yeah. And, you know, with, with just Huxley and, and um, you know, H.G. Wells, I mean, okay. So, so Aldous Huxley is the brother of Julian Huxley. Julian Huxley is basically, was the first director general of the United Nations educational, scientific, and cultural organization. If you read the UNESCO, its purposes and its philosophy, you can get the PDF free online. He talks all about how, you know, the, the, the new global order should have, should be based on eugenics. He's like, you know, not necessarily the Hitler stuff, but, you know, we should be using <laughs> what later he called the, the new synthesis or the new evolution. Okay, he was also the president of the British Eugenics Society. Um, excuse me. And so, you know, and, and, then his, and then his grandfather was T.H. Huxley. Now, T.H. Huxley was Darwin's bulldog. Uh, you know, I sometimes say that Darwinism should have been named after Huxley instead because Darwin came up with the theory, but he was a shy guy. He didn't like to be in public. And so it was Huxley who actually, you know, pushed it. And if you read, you know, Darwin's stuff, you know, his cousin Galton is the guy that came up with eugenics. You know, the, the title of the book was the, uh, the subtitle is The Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. So, you know, this is. I mean, this is a continuous chain of propaganda, both at the academic level and at the literary level. So you also mentioned how it's, you know, you mentioned conditioning, right, as part of it. Well, um, you know, maybe some people might call it grooming or shaping, you know. Uh, basically what it means is if you want people to make a huge change, uh, it's easier to may have them condition them to make several smaller changes over time Tiny as cuts. opposed to Tiny cuts. Kind of, the whole way. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and you've, you've probably, yeah, everybody's probably heard the frog in the boiling water as the right. euphemism, you know, this incremental approach, um, you know, and, and so, right, that's that's been coming for uh, for quite a long time. And, you know, the fact that all this Huxley, you know, when I mention to people that I have all of his nonfiction books, I got them all right up here on the, on the wall here. Uh, and if you read his nonfiction books, he was all about eugenics, right? And, right. and uh, he, he literally talked about a, a, a scientific caste system, which is what I call your social credit. I call it a digital caste system. Um, and so he, line, he was all, he was all about it. You can't do anything. <laughs> yeah, and he, you know, I, when I tell people that he was about this stuff, you know, uh, they, they're like, no, that was a warning, right? And then, you know... You have to unpack so much history for people that have largely just kind of gone with what was on the TV and what was in the textbooks that, like, by the time you provide the backstory for the make the point, they've either, like, checked out or they're looking at you like you're crazy or something. You know what I mean? 
You know, that is so. so true, bro. That is there's so many layers to this, and there's so much to unpack. And literally, I, I keep saying it, you know, the people who like girls or whoever in high school, I hate history. This is my worst subject. Those are the people who are really getting bit in the ass because unless you know history, obviously you're doomed to repeat it. And it helps being a history guy myself. You recognize these patterns. You see the same players, like you said, the Huxleys or the Rockefellers, etc. So there is so much to unpack. And that's such a great point. By the time you lay it all out, the person's like, what the fuck? It's like it's over. I've been doing this. I just say their sponges are non-absorbent, bro. Well, that's what I'm saying. I've been doing this since I was 16 in JFK, and just I'm still getting my mind blown all the time. So your no regular normie's probably like, what the fuck did you just say, dude? I mean, <laughs> even just this episode, you're just unloading so much information. It's really tough right. to – and I I'm absorbing it, but for the lay man or to the lay woman, if there's a lot to it. Sure. Yeah, I, I usually I'm like, I got an hour. Let me just – machine guns <laughs> yeah as much data as possible before people before i'm out so but yeah i should slow down sometimes well uh, no a no, lot of our listeners i mean we've been going for a while so a lot of our listeners is familiar with you know internet of things elon musk the neural link so it's like they're not i mean somebody that might be their first episode but if you go back into our archives we have a lot of this stuff so Oh yeah, great, great show with uh, Rosa Corey and Whitney Webb. I really got a lot of data that I hadn't. You know, I should have. I should mention this. I didn't mention the Agenda Twenty Thirty, Agenda Twenty One stuff in the book because I always thought of it as like this eco-based. It all centered around sustainability. But then when I listened to her uh, sh her show with you, and she mentioned the education process, and I looked, and I'm looking at what I'm looking at in education. It's exactly the same system that she's talking about. And by the way, I they, they, sustainability is part of these i guess it's their new a priori their phony uh their yes. faux a priori philosophy that they punch underneath their you know skeptical uh, frankfurt school of postmodernism uh, you know we're all in this together for the earth and all this stuff when it's you know everything that rosa tells you it's about but um but when I really they like they said they started with the eugenics and then they moved into the climate change and like all was basically to the same end but just using different nomenclature to bring in you know whatever this new normal as she calls it yeah, well, so so eugenics, you know, I like to break it up into two parts. There was the, you know, I would just call it classical eugenics proper, which is about the quality of the gene pool. And then there was the Malthusian component, which is about the quantity of the gene pool. Now, you know, you don't, you, so you want to only have a, an optimal population size. But then, of course, within that, you know, you're going to tier your caste system and you only want so many alphas, so many betas, etc. Uh, but Malthusianism... Large. I mean, you, people still use the term. Actually, Bill Gates, uh, William Gates, Senior, his his uh, dad, and it's on my Twitter. The the document where he says, "Yeah, you know, he uses the term Malthusian. You know, the, uh, we really did some good work that the neo Malthusians, you know, warned us about, but we've we've kind of pushed that 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 goal back. So the neo Malthusians would have been people like uh, Paul Ehrlich. You know, basically said, you know, every so many years we're all gonna, uh, you know." There's going to be this eco crisis, and there's going to be this mass depopulation from famine, pestilence, and war. Um, so that is so that is definitely part of the eugenics. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. yep. And, and some of those early eco, uh, you know, uh, some of those early environmentalist organizations came out of people like Frederick Osborne, who was part of the American Eugenics Society. So, like well, WWF. To, well, uh, sorry, a way for me to simplify this, you know, is I have, I have um, three three kids. And when my two oldest were in elementary, you know, the Common Core garbage, you know, I started running into that when they were in elementary school. And they would have the most ridiculous word um, word problems for math. You know, if, if Jimmy uh, landed on a beach on an island and walked seven miles north and three miles west and then one mile south, um, how many miles had he walked? And it'd be like, well, it was it was purple. And it was a coconut. And I'm not bullshit. And it was so <laughs> insane. And what that was designed, one thing I recognized right away that I designed about Common Core is that it was so foreign to the parents that the parents would have to struggle. A lot of parents would have to struggle. And look, my wife's my wife became a doctor in chiropractic and has a science degree. And she studied in a language. She had to come here to America. She's for her first language is French. She didn't even hardly speak English when she got here. She was smart enough to become a doctor and study to become a doctor in a language that wasn't even her language when she got here. So that tells you how smart she is. And we would look at these questions and go, this is bizarre. So the, the average Joe like myself, who got punched in the head for a living, is looking at this and going, and so there's a lot of parents out there that simply can't help their kids. Now what you've done is shown the kids that their parents, in a way, can't help them. Kind of useless. 
and the, now the school and the and the society, just as the Clintons and all these people have talked about, that parents, the, the kids do not belong to the parents. They belong to the society, right? Society. It takes a village. That's, that's, that's simplifying it for people to understand how evil these people are and the tactics and techniques that they will take and the road that they will take to destroy families. Yeah, and the sad thing is that a lot of times people, there's so, there are so many people, uh, some of them are my friends, uh, some people, are people that I work with, some people that I like, you know, uh, they, they genuinely think that when they go with the, the, newest, the new trendy thing in education, that they're really helping the kids, that they're really helping the students, that they're really, you know, we're these social justice warriors. And you know, and if you and if and and it's man, uh, I've tiptoed around these topics with you know the people that obviously have cognitive dissonance, uh, and it's been a journey trying to <laughs> push back with it, you know, at the same time. Uh, but I uh, I managed to get myself on one of these committees where they're going to talk about how they're going to distribute this CARES money, and I know, I know, I do, I noticed there's a lot of good administrators and good good people that actually just don't even they don't i'm trying to without you know talking about skull and bones and all that you know going i'm trying to just show them look this is what the law says this is what the software does and you know uh and i i think a lot of, like i feel like i mean they invited me on there to, to keep talking i feel like people are can be receptive you know i, I just think that we all have to also be, and this is, you know, to break through that, this paradigm we're talking about, you know, there's a lot of people that want to do like, uh, you know, I guess we'll call it the Alex Jones method where you just like, you know, stop screaming hollering. And I'm not saying that that doesn't have a place, but, you know, most people, I think, want you to be friends with them first, get to know them, treat them like a human being. And then when the time is right, timing is all is key, you know, be, be polite and, uh, you know, just, just try to give them the facts as much as possible. But I think that, sure. you know... Uh, yeah, you know, well, and again, going back to the language, I mean, again, people, people are so often looking for that shortcut to thinking. <clears throat> they don't have time to unpack this stuff, and they use, they hear this benevolent language, you know, sustainability, you know, it takes a village. And then so it, it makes it easier for them to really kind of fall for it. Like, no, this can't be bad. Sustainability sounds great. Or climate change or protecting the earth. Everyone loves that. But they're so, like I said, the, the benevolent language oftentimes masks their very male malevolent and nefarious purposes. You know what I mean? So it, it's really cool. We're even doing this show to get people on to, like, blow my mind or blow off our minds and just kind of attempts to unpack some of this stuff. Because there's, again, not to sound redundant, but there is so much to it. And even what we're seeing right now in the collapse of everything, it's our kids, man. What legacy are we leaving our kids? Like Pat just said, these are some dark motherfuckers, man. And they, they it's social social engineers, man. There's it's it's a wicked science, man, and it works, and they know it works. And they're they're coming after all of us, but they're definitely coming after our kids. Yeah, and you know, you you mentioned, you know, people, you know, uh buying into it, uh, basically at an emotional level, right? Um, you know. So the trivium is grammar, logic, and rhetoric. And so, you know, when we use logic, that means, you know, that we use that above our passions or our emotions, right? We use it in, in, in spite of, right? I mean, we look at we look at that. But a lot of this, um, you know, a lot of this Frankfurt School type stuff is basically, you know, that your emotions are, you know, they basically invert the triangle. So I draw it as a triangle, logo at the top, ethos and pathos at the bottom. So that's character. Uh, you know, logic and emotion, but they invert it and they put the emotion on on top, which is basically yeah. what Freud did, right? I mean, Freud, Freud's id, his ego and his super ego, that's just a play on ethos, logos, and pathos, right? Super ego is logos, it's the mm -hmm. thinking part that says, don't do that, you know? And then pathos is the id, that's the, the passions, you know? For him, it was all the sexual stuff, but, you know, for other people, it could just be fear or anger, right? <laughs> or confusion. Uh, and then the, 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 uh, the ego is the ethos or the character it's the part that you actually act out okay and then and then another another guy that you know you can you can kind of fit into the to the whole skeptical school of phenomenology would would be Nietzsche and his would have been he would have put ethos at the top so your will your will or what you do is more important than what you feel or what you think right and so people are inundated with this this way of thinking before I bring data to them so that, that's why I said it's important to 
to, to connect with like make you have to build trust before you can do a lot talk with certain people about this, sure. you know and, and that, well and that's why know, I, posted, and, yeah, I, I posted on facebook um i believe it was yesterday you know we had an episode with former spetsnaz special operator he was a terrorist hunter uh for the soviet union when the soviet union fell and so we always love to have him on to discuss he's experienced this type of a breakdown before, although this is more the technocracy, but but either way, a breakdown of a nation and and the fracturing of it, and something that everybody is operating off, uh, or many people are operating off, is emotions on their thought processes, and that's what's got us into this shitstorm to begin with. So I just posted, you know, words to heed from our good friend Sonny Pozika, former Spetsnaz operator who was in the old Soviet Union when it fell into chaos. Being proactive, not reactive, is your best plan of action right now. Take emotions out of your thought process immediately. Yeah, and you know, Charlotte, Charlotte Thompson is her beat. Um, she, her research, I didn't focus a lot on it. I, I mentioned some of it, but she, uh, she shows that, you know, a lot of this so-called the polytechnical workforce training, yeah, it was a Soviet model, and it was, uh, Reagan signed agreements with Gorbachev. I did an interview with her on the Opperman report a week or two ago, where she she breaks it down. If you want to hear more about, she can. She's much better expert that can articulate that efficiently that, that I can't. But she she would say that right. I mean, you know, uh, that even uh, the, the school element is also itself, you know, part of the part of the Soviet Soviet system. I, I you know I largely looked at it from looking at big tech and so you know i guess i used the term corporate fascist more than i use communist but you know just just like sutton shows you know uh, you have these uh oligarchs who basically i don't care if it's communist or fascist as long as they get to control it and they'll like they'll play both sides exactly. you know, one side in one country and another side in another and so, Bingo. Yeah. <clears throat> so yeah that's the frustrating part because at the top they they always play both sides off against each other and something, you know, going back to almost the psychological aspect and going back to the Brave New World, I found it so very prescient, once again, hearing uh, Aldous Huxley in an interview saying there's going to come a time where the, we're going to we're going to want, we're going to love, we're going to need the the apparatus of slavery. We're going to fight for it. And when you take it away, we're like, no, let me have my phone. You know, all, all these things now, the growing technocracy that we see, we're, we're, we're fighting for it. We're almost literally fighting for our own enslavement. Yeah. And, Don't say um, we. We, 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 don't say we, you got a turd in your pocket? Uh, no, you know what I mean. I mean, the, the, the direction that society's <laughs> the normies, going, you know what I mean? The normies. The, the normies, there we go. Well, the TikToks. Yeah, Huxley, said, Huxley said that, and, um, you know, basically what he said is right, that instead of people saying, give me my free freedom back right they would they would want their they would want to be uh basically enslaved and you know he was also part a big part of the counterculture movement you know so uh you know he was all about in you know in america you know i mean uh, did he know, write uh, what was it the center of the cyclone did he write that too i think it was about psychedelics I'm sorry, i might be crossing the streams he, there I'm sorry. what i know he wrote about psychedelics is uh the doors of perception to the gates of heaven and hell which is you know it's a william blake quote but it's uh it's the right. basis for the, the the doors you know the band the doors yeah uh, yeah um when the doors of perception are truly are cleansed things will appear as they truly are infinite right yeah, I like that quote. It's uh, awesome, it's, isn't it? it? You know, Blake's cool. Yeah, you know, but uh, but yeah, no, Huxley was totally, you know, they wanted to use that movement, you know, and people, you know, you can just look at, remember the MK Ultra stuff from the '60s, you know, or, right. Uh, right. you know, uh, you and Cameron, you know, all all those guys. Uh, which, which, by the way, you know, basically they come out of, you know, the, the Project Paperclip stuff, the, the, the Nazi eugenic stuff that was brought over here, which is funded by Skull and Bones, which is basically propagated, you know, in the eugenic philosophy of Aldous Huxley, right? So it's, you know, again, it all fits. It all well, and that's another thing. part of that behavioral scientist, uh, you know, social engineers, you know, they've refined, I mean, they were working on that MK Ultra stuff back in the day. Now, again, not all of us, but they've MK Ultra damn near a planet and countries and, you know, masses of people because they've, they've literally refined that science. Fear-based conditioning, yeah. et cetera. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, um, and, you know, I, you know, the, the end game now is basically to take the fear base. Right, it is to take the tech, the technology, the surveillance, and then just to blur all of it together into this. I mean, the best way I, I just keep calling it social credit because if any, if you haven't looked at the ABC, I wish I could remember the name of the, the report, but it's a, a little docu series. You can get it on YouTube. Uh, 
And you just look at it. I mean, they basically track these people in real time with these. So, so they get access to health care, transportation, education, housing. Uh, you can even be on a political blacklist based on not just what you post on social media, but also based on how you behave in public, what you put in your shopping cart in real time, yes. you jaywalk, all this type of stuff. And so, you know, the education system, when I, you know, I hate to say it like this, but all this stuff. Is da- all this technology functions by data mining. And so, you know, just, just in order to be interactive, right? So the adaptive learning software, the idea is that it can, all this stuff can personalize uh, lessons. Well, the only way it can personalize lessons to you is if it can not only track the data input, but also the data output. And so it has a third layer where it's basically coming up with these new algorithms. So what, it, what that means is that if you think that the machine is helping you learn, you're also helping the machine learn. Yes. Right, and the machine learns way faster than you. So in the end, I mean, the education, this techno education system, this new technocracy, is essentially going to be an engine to build AGI. So that's artificial general intelligence. That's a computer that can, you know, Sophie, you know, Sophia, uh, that thing you mentioned. She still is pretty. I mean, she's not quite AGI yet. She's got some pretty complex natural language algorithms. Uh, if you see her with Ben Gertzel, he had it talking to another one. They got caught in this loop, and they, they do weird stuff. So it's not mm-hmm. quite spontaneous. It's, it's not quite as thinking like a human being. Yet. It's not conscious right. like that. Uh, but what they what they want to do is take all the data that they're going to mine from all the little boys and girls all the way as they develop from younger to older, scanning their brain, scanning their neural algorithms, scanning their cognitive behavioral algorithms, putting that into this larger big data pool in order so that uh, machine learning can come up with AGI and they can come up with their supercomputers, their internet of things that they want everybody plugged into with a brain computer interface, so uh, now an we- Elon Musk neural yeah, yes. now we've got to talk about we've got to talk about solutions because you know we've had special forces guys on here that can sneak into anywhere. We talked about that, um, talking about you know Skylink headquarters, talking about you know media, social media headquarters, talking about the the dis- dissemination of of misinformation, you know of mists and, and everything else that's going on. You know, Navy SEALs, Delta Force, you know Russian Spetsnaz, guys like that could break into places like that in a heartbeat, uh, destroy the place, plant explosives, destroy destroy it all, but but once we get to a certain point of, you know, constant drone constant surveillance, you know, Skylink's already up in the air, you know, things are up and running. Um, well, people aren't going to be able to move. People aren't going to be able to do anything without being tracked. Even if you bring your phone, they're going to they're, they're going to follow your facial recognition and everything else. Uh, people will be alerted the minute you even get near near a compound to get into it. Um, so, you know, the question I pose is, what's the solution? Do we just uh, somehow, we, you know, does uh, somebody a white hat? decide that, well, it's going to cost a lot of lives, but we've got to detonate an EMP above uh, these continents and bring the whole grid down, bring everything down, destroy everything, and and just uh, start it all over again, man. Because this is this is scary, scary enslavement of mankind. That's yeah, been in the I works mean, so- for decades, too. That's the other thing. It's been in work forever. Right. Yeah, br- yeah, brain-computer interfaces, by the way, are about 70 years old, right? First neural implants uh, in the 60s. But uh, I think, so, you know, I, I got a, you know, I had a five in the book. It's got a five-point plan for solutions. And, you know, they're very technical. You know, some of them are, you know, about how should we govern the schools? What types of methods should we use to teach? One is about how, what type of privacy we should have for the technology. But I think the most important is what we talked about is the, is the philosophy part. Now, you know... Obviously, you know, that we just said this is kind of like coming up against brick wall sometimes. So, you know, procedurally, you know, crisis works both ways. And think of it like a scramble in wrestling, right? No one really has control yet. Uh, so, you know, like I, what I'm trying to do is try to convince people, look, they're going to get – right now, people are getting CARES money, uh, schools, okay? Just to talk about schools in particular, to, up, to upgrade their technology while people are forcibly locked down. Well – there's ways we can do this without having all this data mining, uh, adaptive learning, automated software. You could just basically do virtual classrooms through something, uh, you know, just make sure that whatever platform you use, obviously that has to have, it has to track some data just to run, but you know, it should, it should basically be as, as bare bones as far as the data that it has to track. It, it shouldn't be any biometric stuff, shouldn't be any neural stuff, certainly no DNA stuff, which is yet down the pipe so that's the first thing you know if you're a teacher right 
don't, don't, you know, I'm, 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 adaptive learning is bad. Adaptive learning software is bad. Competency-based education is bad, okay? These do not, if you can do anything as a board member or as a teacher, push back against that and come up and come up with an alternative, okay? And there's plenty of, there's plenty, you know, we're using computers right now. I'm not saying computers are bad. All right, so use use a virtual classroom that doesn't data mine, doesn't have adaptive learning software. So, philosophically, at you know at the curriculum level, I mean, some I largely was you know talk talk bad about or, you know the the school choice movement in the sense that it's it's neither public nor private. It's it's basically communo fascist. It's blurring everything together. But that's sure. I'm not against homeschooling. I'm not against private schooling, like an actual private school that is funded by private dollars and not taking public dollars in the meantime. Uh, it's just if you're going to homeschool, again, don't stay away from the adaptive learning software. You know, do a classical curriculum, do a classical education, um, you know, and uh, don't take any, you know, don't take, they, they can have education savings accounts and tax credits. You know, if you take that stuff, usually what's going to come with it is strings attached to use the adaptive learning software yes. or some other, some other federal requirement, you know, which is right. going to be part of this big, big package. Okay. And then the last thing is, you know, you know so that's, that's procedurally and philosophically. Uh, but then it's just going to be some people that are going to have to make some tough decisions that are just, you know, I think about that woman that decided to cut hair and take care of her kids. And when the judge basically said, well, I'll let you back out if you apologize, she said, I ain't apologize for taking care of my kids. You know what I mean? Like, the, like at the end of the day, you know, I'm one person on this committee. You know, most people, I think, you know, probably like probably like a lot of the stuff that I'm trying to say we shouldn't do. And, you know, I still respect them either way. But the point is, you know, uh, that at that point, when it gets to that point, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be up to the parents and the students to basically say, oh, you know, to, to kind of, you know. Opt uh, out. Yeah, opt that's out. a good yeah. way to say it. I was going to say, I was, yeah, I didn't want to say it in a way it sounded too aggressive, but yes. <laughs> yeah, that's not, I mean, but that's it. That's the only reason any of this is able to go on is that we participate in it. So, A, our silence equals acquiescence, and we just must not participate in the nonsense. The reindeer sure. games are... Are not for are not for me and not for you guys. I'm sure. Oh, and that's that's why I brought up that woman because she she to me is a, is a hero and you know and you know she basically was at a point where she didn't have anything already and she she took that risk and so you know yeah. Yeah, like you said, there's got to be some. There's going to be more of those kind of choices. We just had on a couple of gentlemen going through the same stuff with the government in New Jersey to open their. I mean, it's just a sad fucking state of affairs when they're letting out criminals and then they criminalize people. You know exercising the right to life, liberty, pursuit of happiness and keeping a business open and a legacy for their kids. I mean, that's, that's how that's war scary. starts, man. That's how yeah, war starts, man. brother. And I guess we're not going to be able to take that back, man. The, the die has been cast and we won't be able to rewind time and 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 not see these people who've been arrested just for exercising their, you know, their American right to own a business, etc. So scary times we're in, my man. Pat, do you have anything closing from my man, John Kleisick? No, dude, John, thank you so much for joining us. I'm glad we finally got you on. You're extremely intelligent, well-versed, and, and we truly appreciate your time today, brother. And it yeah. takes a bunch. I'm not too far from Iowa. Do you still have your gym? I would like to just come out there. I do a little bit of amateur stuff on the side. I've done it for about 20 years. I'd like to. I think you went to uh, Blackerby Academy uh, in Peoria and did, did a seminar once. Yeah, I did a seminar over there. I, I, I still do seminars, but I, I've trained law enforcement and stuff, and I do you know broadcasting and do you know, a couple different podcasts, of course, this one being the most popular, um, and focus on that. So I do not have a gym anymore. I retired from coaching and everything, but uh, a lot of people have actually been encouraging me lately to open one back up and start teaching people how to survive on the streets, which I'm actually better at than, I'm actually better at that than fighting in a cage. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I think I am too. I only did a couple of amateur fights. I decided that a long, a long time ago. But I thought it'd be cool just to meet in person and, and roll. Or, uh, or hey, man, we can get together and have lunch anytime. Where, where are you at? I'm in um, uh, Chicago area, so you know, about four hours from da- your Davenport, right? Um, you know, if you're in Chicago, if you're in Chicago, you're two and a half hours east of me, brother. Oh, it's, it's only two. Oh, yeah, we're we're close by. Yeah, that would be cool. I won't man. spend. I won't spend. I, I gotta tell you, you gotta meet me in Iowa for lunch though, because I'm not spending shit in Illinois. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. Hey, I would. I want to get out of Illinois right now and go to places where you guys probably got way less restrictions. Than we Come over to Iowa. heaven, otherwise known as Iowa. Yeah, yeah, we just had a we just had an Illinois state senator on yesterday, and going back to education. Um, they were already way in the hole, and they raised their budget like one point something billion dollars, and didn't give shit for education. So Illinois is just a shit show, man. Uh, John, where can we find you, man? Track you down website, anything where we can find out, you know, how people can keep track of what you're up to. 
So School World Order is my website, and then my Twitter is at Dallas Professor, or it's at Professor Dallas, one or the other. We'll, we'll find it. <laughs> It'll be in the description, ladies and gentlemen. And if you don't know, now you know. The show can also not only be heard on all outlets for podcasts, we are also on Dish TV, the Dish TV network. Go to Dish Communities, search for the Conspiracy Farm, and you will find us doing what we do. John, again, thank you so very much, man. This is a very, very informative episode. Champ, love you, brother. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, peace and all kinds of love. Stay tuned. You know the deal. There will always be more. <laughs>